Yakuza 4 was my first experience with the Yakuza series. I played a demo of the game on my PlayStation 3 in 2010 and immediately fell in love. I then subsequently forgot that Yakuza existed for 6 years until I played Yakuza 0. Good evening, my name is John Hub and I talk about video games on the internet. And today, we'll be 100%ing Yakuza 4. If this is somehow the first video of mine you've come across, I'm challenging myself to 100% all of these Yakuza games, all in under a year. Will Yakuza 4 be a surprisingly peaceful and chill experience to 100%, or will it leave me crying for mommy? Wah, wah. Find out all of this and more in this installment of Year of Like a Dragon. In case you didn't know, this game is actually called Yakuza 4 because there are four playable characters in it. You play as every character one at a time for four chapters each, for individual parts of the game's story, before getting access to everyone during the finale. Because of this, I wanted to structure this video in a similar fashion, with each part reflecting a major category of completing the game. This is a video about 100%ing a game, so it may stun and shock viewers to hear that there may be some spoilers. But with all that being said, let's get right into it. Akiyama is the first character that we gain control of, and this is the first time we've started a game with a character other than Kiryu. And you may be asking, is Kiryu even in this game? I don't know, you'll have to watch and subscribe and like the video and give me a million dollars to find out. To give a brief summary of his part of the story, Akiyama is a loan shark at a company called Sky Finance, which he also owns. He gives no interest loans to anyone, contingent on them passing a test of true character, but when a woman named Lily comes to Sky Finance asking for a loan of 100 million yen, we as the audience immediately assume something is up. As part of her test, Akiyama requires her to earn 3 million yen working at his cabaret club in just 3 days. Lily passes this test, but we do find out two things about her. Number one, that she's responsible for recent murders of multiple Yakuza officers. And number two, that she's currently being searched for by multiple Yakuza families, including the Majima family. Oh yeah! We're given the explanation that Majima intends to protect Lily, and I'll leave the story there for now. Akiyama's story section is among one of the easiest in the whole game, if not the easiest. This is due to a couple of things. Firstly, he's the first character that we play as, so it would make sense that his part would be the easiest. More importantly though, this character is way too overpowered for someone with seemingly no prior combat experience. He fights with almost exclusively kicks, again for no discernible reason. He's fast and he does a ton of damage to boot. He's a fan favorite character to play as in Yakuza 4, and for good reason. The only combat section of his that I even remotely struggled on was with Midorikawa, who uses a chainsaw and can super armor through most attacks. Other than that, Akiyama's section was an absolute cakewalk, and he's the best, and I love him. Next. The story continues with Saijima. We find out that Lily's real name is Yasuko Saijima, and this guy is her freaking brother! Saijima's section starts with him in prison. We find out he's been in jail for the last 25 years for, to steal a word from TikTok, unaliving 18 people. He escapes from prison, has a quick run-in with some guy, and spends the rest of his part finding out what he's missed out on all these years. His part ends with him reuniting with his old Yakuza buddy, not sure if you've ever heard of him, Goro freaking Majima. These two were besties and Saijima was actually led to believe that Majima betrayed him, when really it was this guy who screwed the both of them over. The gameplay of Saijima's entire section kinda sucks. It's the worst part by far. You started by doing the most boring preparation for a prison escape I've ever seen in any media, and then the prison escape itself is no joke. You fight Kiryu, which is pretty rad, but then spend the rest of the part crawling through the sewers and sneaking on the rooftops to avoid the police. There's a part where you have to travel in the most roundabout way throughout the entire city of Kamrocho just to go from the back of the Millennium Tower to the front. The only remotely difficult combat encounter was with Majima at the end, but even that was pretty trivial. The last thing I'll say about Saijima is that his playstyle is pretty boring. More than any character in perhaps any Yakuza game, his moveset is simple to the point that you can just spam the same combo over and over and use one of two heat actions, depending on if an enemy is near a wall or not. Saijima is slow, but is able to super armor through basically all enemies. He's not a weak character by any means, just simple even by Yakuza game standards. By contrast, Tanimura is my favorite guy in the whole world. He's a police officer whose father got, shall I say, unalived while investigating the case of Saijima unaliving 18 people. His entire part revolves around the case, and we discover that not only is Saijima innocent, but he's innocent in a way that makes me dislike his part of the story even more. Apparently, 
Saejima was given guns with rubber bullets, and it was really this guy that did all that bad stuff. So Saejima is innocent, yippee! Tanimura continues to uncover more about this case, and finds out that everyone and their mom was involved, including his own boss. Talk about a toxic workplace. Tanimura also finds his father's killer, and teams up with Akiyama to protect Yasuko. But enough about Tanimura's part of the story, which I did leave a lot out of, but I think all the important stuff is there. Anyway, I want to talk about his gameplay. Oh my goodness, what a beautiful character. There's a case to be made that the other characters are stronger than he is, but I just find him so fun to play as. He's advertised as this technical and defensive expert, but holy shit can he dish out damage when he needs to. He has a move, a counter, a heat action for literally any scenario. He can chain a heat action after any heavy attack and a combo. He has a parry that you can hold for actually 5 seconds straight and it has a heat action for landing it. Not to mention he can one-shot any non-boss enemy with his arrest heat action. His only real weaknesses are a short attack range and trouble dealing with large groups of enemies. More on that later. The only parts I truly struggled on for Tanimura are when you're holding a briefcase full of money for an extended combat section and the boat chase mission. Basically, I only struggled when I couldn't use his actual moveset. I could make this an hour-long video on Tanimura alone, but to save everyone time, I'll move on to our last playable character. Okay, so you know when I said you have to give me $300 for me to tell you if Kiryu was in the game? That was a lie, but thank you for doing it anyway. Kiryu ironically feels like the least necessary character in this whole game. Like the game and the story could hypothetically exist without him, but he's just the fucking homie and he's like part of the crew. Like, like Kiryu bro, the room just shines a little brighter when you're around. I love you, man. Throughout maybe the whole Yakuza series, there's a case to be made that Kiryu's whole vibe has been that he doesn't want to get involved until Yakuza tensions are high and things are getting dire. In Yakuza 4, he does not want to be involved, but he gets involved, fights Tanimura and Akiyama in one of the coolest fights in the series thus far, helps identify every key figure that's used the hit Saejima got arrested for in order to increase their favor and influence within the Yakuza or the police force, and saves Saejima in order to form the Yakuza 4. This game is literally the Avengers, and Kiryu is the robot guy. After the horrible, hellish, no good, very bad combat sections I endured in Yakuza 3, playing Kiryu in Yakuza 4 is a breath of fresh air. He plays basically identical to any other game he's appeared in, but he feels great nonetheless. Despite having some of the hardest combat sections in the game by far, his only truly difficult part for me was the fight against Saito in the first chapter, and the rest was not too bad due to him being so powerful. I believe through having Yakuza 3 save data, I also got access to a bunch of upgrades from the start. It was a pretty cool detail in my opinion. And that's pretty much it for each character in their respective storylines. Everyone unites together for the final fight in the finale, but I'll get to that later on in the video. With the story pretty much complete, I want to mention everything I did for completion as I reached this point. In addition to every character having their own storyline, they also have their own activities or main side things as I'd like to call them. I would never ask you the viewer to write hashtag main side things in the comments. Please don't do it. Please don't do it. I'll be using this part of the video to go over everyone's main side things. A sizable portion of Akiyama's story revolves around the Hostess Club Elise, an establishment that he owns and uses to prove that Yasuko Saejima is worthy of a sizable loan. Well, aside from the segment of the story where you're in the club, you also have to train three other hostesses to rank one as part of Hostess Maker. If you've played Yakuza 3 or seen my video on it, you already know what this is. You pace up and down the main floor of the club, choose the same dialogue options to train your hostesses, wash, rinse, repeat for 8-9 to nine hours, and you're done. Yakuza 4 makes one extra thing pretty much mandatory for getting rank 1, which is gauging what the patrons of the club want to see style-wise in the hostesses, and then constructing outfits that fit what they're looking for. So in addition to pacing back and forth, you now have to cycle between the same three pre-made outfits. Also required for the completion of the trophy list in this game is unlocking every possible piece of clothing for the hostesses. This wouldn't be a problem if getting all hostesses to rank 1 didn't lock you out of the hostess maker. This essentially means that you have to purposely not play optimally until you get every dress for the trophy, then complete this main side thing. I was also losing it because I was missing exactly three outfits, which I later discovered are tied to one specific hostess. This might have been the activity that I spent the single most time on. 
Saejima's main activity is Fighter Maker, or as I like to call it, Hostess Maker for Dudes, oh yeah! Saejima, who's basically a natural born alpha, is tasked with training five little puny weak sad balding sad men to fight in the Colosseum. You get 50 turns to train each fighter to win a Colosseum tournament all on their own. Completing each fighter's tournament will allow you to choose them as partners in the doubles matches in the Colosseum, and they also show up as opponents in the single matches too. I thought that was pretty cool. This whole mode is a great idea with pretty subpar execution. I found that a couple of the training options did little to nothing to improve my fighter. The fighters that you're training mostly fight all on their own, which would be fine if a couple of them didn't straight up suck, even when they're nearly maxed out. And strategy wise, I found that I could just spam the special moves, which are the only player input that you're even able to do in the battles, which kind of undercuts the fundamental idea of fighters having to do all of this on their own. Losing a match also demoralizes your fighter to the point that you're better off just saving after every turn and reloading when you lose a fight. All of that being said, I actually would love for this mode to return in a future game with better implementation, because it's actually my favorite of the character specific main side stuff. You could probably assume what I think of the next stuff I'll be talking about. Tanimura's side objective consists of him responding to reports from his handy dandy police scanner. You pretty much just wait until text displays at the bottom of the screen, telling you where a nearby crime is taking place. You go there, resolve the issue either by fighting or by chasing the perpetrators, and you do this like 20 times until you're done. These continue to appear even after you've done enough for the completion of this one, but you're not required to do them. Kiryu's main side thing is taking down rival gangs, similar to the street boss system from Yakuza Kiwami 2. You do a few random encounters with a gang until you're informed that the leader is somewhere in the area. You find the leader, fight them, and you do this for seven different gangs. This one wasn't too bad at all, and you actually aren't required to get in any random encounters for anything other than this mechanic in Yakuza 4. So it's good to see that random encounters serve a purpose here completion wise. There's also a trophy for defeating 10 gang members and claiming their emblems after beating every gang. This one and Tanimura's are pretty easy and also pretty forgettable and bland. Not much to write home about. Substories in Yakuza 4 are strange. Considering there's four playable characters, you'd think the game would be filled to the brim with substories. However, each character has 16 substories each, except for Saejima who has 15, for a grand total of 63 substories. I felt that a majority of these were largely forgettable, and really only one substory stuck with me for each character. For Akiyama, he does that TikTok trend of trading a cheap item for a more expensive item until he eventually owns the deed to the whole city. Saejima runs into an urban legend folklore creature off of some ancient alien shit, Tanimura fucking Kit unalives himself, and Kiryu meets the real Spider-Man. Look guys, it's Spider-Man! As is Yakuza tradition, the final substory is a fight with the members of the Amon clan, and it's the Yakuza 4 versus the Amon 4. This is probably my favorite Amon fight in the series so far, as they all fight differently and encourage you to use each character's movesets in creative ways. You get a whole lot of nonsense for completing the substories. Just some gear and a pretty decent sword, which is alright in combat. But, that reminds me, speaking of combat related things and such, Combat is the one thing in this game that I truly could not get enough of. It really does feel great to play every character, even if some are more fun than others. When they make a Yakuza 4 2, my biggest wishlist item is more combat encounters. If you couldn't already tell, this part is devoted to all things combat. And mini games are here too. They didn't fit smoothly into any other sections, I pray that this doesn't harsh the vibes too bad for everyone. Anyway. Now you'd expect for a game with four playable characters, that the Colosseum would be a bloated, repetitive, stupid idiot mess of an activity to complete. Well, they answered my prayers, and they kinda did it a little too well, and I kinda wish that the Colosseum was longer. The Colosseum is only available to Kiryu and Saejima for some reason, and completing it consists of doing all 12 of the tournaments available to Kiryu, and then those same tournaments plus one additional one for Saejima. Technically, the game does track if it's the first time you're fighting an opponent, so some may say that a true 100% of Yakuza 4 would consist of fighting everyone in the Colosseum. I wouldn't, but some would. In conclusion, the Colosseum was very easy and very cool and very fun, and I did it. I don't really know what else to say, so I guess that's it. Uh, go to the next slide. Just to go on a tangent for a quick second, didn't you guys hate when you'd be presenting a group project and then the PowerPoint controller would be not paying attention so you end up having to awkwardly ask them to advance the slide? Well, luckily, 
when it comes to presenting information, I know a couple of people with the hookup. I'm talking about training masters. They have the power to point you in the right direction. Each character has their own individual master to train with. As Akiyama, we're introduced to Saigo, who shoots you a bunch to teach you to kick good. Saijima meets a master named Master, who lives in the sewer and tells you to kick rocks. Literally! Completing his trials unlocks new areas in the underground sewers, which are basically just like these empty tunnels and rooms. I don't think they really do anything, and the only thing of note that happens in these areas are the trainings that you do to unlock the areas in the first place. While I'm on the topic, Yakuza 4 introduces multiple rooftop and underground areas to Kamurocho. These are largely empty and usually only intended for one thing, if any. My only suggestion for when Yakuza 4 2 comes out is to utilize these areas a little bit more. Tanimura's master is Nair. She has Tanimura's exact moveset, which means that she can be an echo fighter of Tanimura when he shows up in the next Smash Bros game. Last and also least, Kiryu trains with Komaki, and he teaches you like two things and then fucks off. I'm still convinced that Kiryu is the least necessary part of this game. The final master is Minamita, who's shared by everyone. He has an Oculus Rift taped to a dentist chair that you can use to fight more better. In addition, everyone has a couple of revelations, which are opportunities to learn new abilities by taking pictures of crazy wacky scenarios that happen on the streets of Kamurocho. I do wish that these were in more games because they are very entertaining. And also, speaking of things that are in every game, do you guys like the transitions in my video? Please be honest. I believe it was Benjamin Franklin who said, in this world, nothing can be said for certain, except death, taxes, and Yakuza having minigames. He would later go on to be a playable character in Tony Hawk's Underground 2, which is actually sick as hell. Look at my boy go! What the hell are you doing on that board, Benny? Get off of there! But the old fucker was right about one thing. Minigames are everywhere in Yakuza 4. Funnily enough, if you were to play this game casually, you could actually go through the whole game without encountering a single minigame. No minigames are required to beat the story, and the completion metrics for the minigames are ominously hidden until you play them for the first time. Like past games, there are both in-game completion metrics for minigames, as well as trophies tied to them. All in all, this might have been the easiest set of minigame challenges I've had to do yet, but I'll still be ranking them in terms of difficulty. There are 23 minigames in Yakuza 4, but in an attempt to avoid broken record allegations, I've put all the casino games as the easiest. Yakuza 4's casino has Baccarat, Blackjack, Poker, and Roulette, all of which can be easily won with the use of cheat items. Next slide, please. I want to address the elephant in the room. There is a building in Theater Square where you can supposedly play Pachinko. If you have the PS4 version of Yakuza 4 Remastered, there are completion metrics and a trophy for this minigame, but no such requirements exist in the PC version. So legally, as a completionist, I have to say that I did indeed enter this building at least once and played this one, which I totally did. Truly, it's one of the games of all time. Chohan consists of a dealer rolling dice, and you the player guessing if the total on the dice is even or odd. It's basically a coin toss. You do it a bunch, and then you get the completion metric. CeeLo is a dice game that's like tossing many coins, and only some of the coins are good. There are cheat items for this one as well, so it's pretty easy to complete. Oicho Kabu is a pretty similar game to Blackjack, and honestly just as easy. This one just took a bit longer than the others because there's no cheat items, but if you play it long enough, it's impossible not to hit the completion metric. Aromatherapy Massage is one of the most simple games on here by far. It's like balancing the balance meter in a Tony Hawk game, but instead of trying to avoid falling, you're trying to avoid... nutting, I think? You have to play this one a minimum of 11 times and you're done. The game of Shogi is as complicated as chess, but... CHEST?! The game of Shogi is as complicated as chess, but in Yakuza 4, you can just do the same easy shogi puzzle five times in a row, and then never touch this minigame again. Buxelios is an arcade game that looks like it has a bit of complexity, but don't let all those polygons confuse you. You blow up spaceship. That's the game. The best strategy for this one is getting all up in the enemy ship's face before you fire. I did this one on the first try. UFO Catcher is a claw game that nobody likes, but it would feel weird if it wasn't in one of these games. Yakuza 4's iteration of the UFO Catcher was a lot easier than any other in my opinion. I don't feel like singing or hitting up an artist to do a song here, so here's a sick-ass guitar riff from the game.
Now, why did they have to ruin perfectly good table tennis by adding a mechanic where you have to stare at the woman you're playing against to build your heat meter? I mean, this is just so messed up. Boom, get the fuck out of here. I don't know if bowling is hard in this game because I found the god angle immediately and bowled over 200 on my first try. If you go back to any of my other Yakuza 100% videos, you'll likely hear me say that I press buttons and one koi koi each and every time without properly understanding how the game works. But I'm here today to tell you that this time around, pressing buttons just wasn't enough. I got beaten non-stop at this one for some reason and decided to sit my ass down and learn. And let me be the first to say, I think Koi Koi might be in my top three favorite mini games. Let's just say, if Mahjong is the love of my life, Koi Koi is my sneaky link. <laughs> oh, hey Mahjong. Um, hey, how you doing? Uh, how? So how much did you hear of that? Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Oh. Um. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay, no, sounds good. Uh, okay. Ever heard of a little game called Baseball? I don't know if it's because I've played a ton of it already, but the batting center in Yakuza 4 wasn't really that bad. I first tried every single challenge. I'm sure you're noticing a trend with the minigames in this game by now. And you'd think that this trend would be broken while I talk about pool, which was by far one of the hardest minigames in Yakuza 3. Well, it kinda wasn't shit this time. It feels like they definitely balanced the pool AI to make even the expert difficulty fair. Thank you, game. They definitely made the darts AI harder, however, which is why I'm putting it at the number 4 spot. On the hardest difficulty, you don't get to make a mistake. Lucky for me, I'm what you might call a quirked up white boy who's goaded with the sauce. And I've even been known to bust it down sexual style. See that? In darts, they call that a fuck shot. It's late in the list, but now we're finally on minigames that made me break a sweat. And holy shit, what were they cooking with Boxelios 2? Like Boxelios 1, the goal is to shoot the weak point of an enemy spaceship. Unlike Boxelios 1, however, the game is in the third dimension with this weird 45 degree angle. This causes the game to feel like you're a little misaligned with the ship at all times. It took a good hour for me to get to level 50 and complete the minigame. Golf is hard, and I'm famously good at golf games, but this golf is hard. Putts always just feel a little off, and I have the added debuff of having played Yakuza 3 Golf, and the physics of that game and the controls are just ever so slightly changed, to the point that shots I may have made were not made. A minus 5 on a 9-hole course is a lot to ask of someone. I couldn't even imagine having no prior golf game experience in trying this. Fishing in Yakuza 4 was probably my least favorite activity of all time. There are 18 unique catches, and it took me maybe 5-6 to six hours to find everything. I say 18 catches and not 18 fish, because half of the time I was catching a damn oil drum. This is embarrassing and a thousand percent a skill issue on my part too, but for some reason my brain did not put together this little light blue area that shows up when you use bait is the active range of your line, meaning that it's extremely unlikely to catch anything in this dark blue region. I, uh, ignored that and then got mad when I couldn't catch anything for a full hour. But this minigame is actually hard as hell, I promise. With all the minigames done, I was onto the ultimate challenge. I really met my match with this thing I'm about to talk about. Ultimate matches are the next problem I decided to take a pass at. They're pairings of pugilistic pitfalls that often puzzle the player and leave them in perilous predicaments. Only through patience, prosperity, and pushing oneself can you persevere and prevent poor performance when proceeding in 100%ing this part. No, I'm just shitting around. These weren't too bad. Usually I'd make a list ranking some of the hardest ultimate matches, but these were all fairly easy, so I just said all that pee bullshit instead. Basically, PENIS! This section of the video is dedicated to basically everything else that I had to do to complete Yakuza 4. Yakuza games could not exist without a healthy helping of repetition, grinding, and somewhat pointless collectibles and challenges. This might be a bold accusation, but five games in, I just know that RGG Studios is personally targeting me with some of these completion metrics. I just can't prove it yet. Completing these games feels like checking items off a checklist one at a time. And nothing feels checklistier. Can I get a hashtag checklistier in chat, please? Thank you. Nothing feels checklistier than Yakuza 4's many collectibles. 
Kamurocho is the sole setting of this game, but they decided to fill the city with 100 locker keys, which open lockers containing items of varying usefulness. Also around town are memos, which are NPCs that you have to talk to for certain in-game advice. NPCs with memo messages are indicated by a blue thingy above their heads, so this wasn't too hard. You need to have every menu item at every restaurant. Since you can only eat when you're not at full health and only drink when you're not fully drunk, the best way I can find to tackle this was by getting an inventory full of fishing bait to reduce my HP before ordering food, and drinking a coffee to sober up. It was a long and monotonous task to be sure, but the only difficult part was locating the last restaurant, which ended up being in the sewers. Ew. The game tracks what heat actions you have and have not performed. Heat actions are special cinematic fight moves that every character has access to. There are a ton of these to keep track of, but I was able to get through it by realizing that a few of them could only be performed at the Coliseum. The less collectible worth mentioning are the trophies slash steam achievements for this game. They have the classic stuff like trophies for beating certain chapters, but I want to talk about the annoying trophies. There aren't many hard or annoying trophies in Yakuza 4, but some that stood out to me are knock over 100 people, which you need perfect precision to knock someone over, otherwise you just stagger them a bit. There's one for having a hostess wear a gift that you give her, which is something I just never did until I realized there was a trophy for it. The worst offender though is the trophy that requires you to beat the game on normal difficulty without reverting it to easy. This isn't bad on its own, but it does require you to beat the game three times to 100% the trophy list. Once for the normal mode trophy, again on hard to unlock legend difficulty, and a third time to beat the game on legend to get the corresponding trophy for that. It was just strange to me that if you beat the game on hard, the normal trophy doesn't pop. Kinda sus. Yakuza 4 is a 10 out of 10 because you can go in a mine, but also, which is great, you can also craft. You can craft weapons and gear at Kamiyama Works. Now this is important, and they need it to make the game this way. So you can only craft weapons in the building on the right corner of the city, and gear can only be crafted on this rooftop on the exact opposite side of the city. Now you have to understand, this had to be this way. It's really important too that the weapon salesman can only sell certain weapons to certain characters, even if they can use the weapons that they're unable to buy. It's just the way things are. It's just the way things have to be. It's just how we've always done things. In terms of the actual crafting, all you need to do is fetch a weapon or a gear item to serve as the base component, and one to two materials for Kamiyama to glue onto there. And boom, you have a crafted thingy. Some standout crafting materials that were a little tricky to fetch were the ones that you could only get from doing the harder batting cages, a handful of materials that you can only get by trading in trash that you pick up to a guy in the sewer. I somehow just scraped by without having to grind for this one, as well as a random item that you can only obtain using that VR chair trainer game that I was talking about earlier. This was one of the last things I did in my playthrough, and the inconvenience of having to run and taxi everywhere was really the worst part of it all. Haruka is Kiryu's adoptive daughter, and she's the driving force of many actions that Kiryu takes throughout the story. In an 100% run, however, she can be a bit demanding. In every game I've played so far with the exception of Zero, there's a post-game system where Haruka has a laundry list of requests that Kiryu must fulfill one at a time to fill a trust meter all the way. Most of these requests are mundane, like going to a few different restaurants, but there are harder requests here and there. There are gambling ones, like leaving a poker table with thousands more than you started with, but the real difficult ones in Yakuza 4 revolved around darts and fishing specifically. She wants you to win a game of 901 in darts in 6 turns, which requires the player to average what amounts to about all bullseyes each turn. For fishing, all you have to do is catch two specific fish, one at a time. For some reason though, I just could not find the fish that I needed. She even gives you advice on what bait to use, what time of day the fish come out, etc. But it ended up just taking a ton of time, and I don't have a lot of that these days. She also asked me to beat level 50 on Boxelios 2, and then I got to level 49 on my first attempt and then couldn't do it again for 30 minutes. It was messed up. All things considered though, her requests in Yakuza 4 are probably the easiest I've done yet. I took entirely too long to finish the cabaret clubs in this game. There are three cabaret clubs that three characters can go to. Three hostesses must be unlocked through getting them to rank 1 in Hostess Maker, at which point you can access all 10 total hostesses. The gameplay loop for this one is skipping through the dialogue as quickly as humanly possible, and then praying that you have just the right words to increase your heart rating with each hostess. 
you get all 10 of them to 20 hearts, go on a couple of dates, and you're done. I saved this for last because it's all monotony and no challenge. Some completion metrics are perfect for watching a movie or a show on the side, and none are better than cabaret clubs for that. With everything else done on every character, I was now ready to tackle the finale of the game. To summarize it in a sentence, the Yakuza 4 unite and fight against the other Yakuza 4? Well, technically not all of them are Yakuza, and one of them has an army of soldiers behind them, but it's a pretty cool final chapter, I'm not gonna lie. Akiyama fights Arai, who's a friend turned enemy by virtue of the events of the story. Saijima fights Kido, which is silly because Saijima big and Kido little. Kiryu fights Daigo Dojima, and they're both shirtless, and I enjoy that. And Tanimura fights the entire fucking city, apparently. The character in this game that's least suited towards fighting a group of enemies has to fight a massive group of enemies as the final, final boss. Excluding the Amon fights, this is by far the hardest combat encounter in the game. But I did that. And then I had to beat the game on hard and on legend mode, so I did that. 76.5 hours later, we've completed Yakuza 4. I don't know if I can recommend that you, the viewer, 100% this game, but I honestly loved it. This might be an unpopular opinion, but Yakuza 4 is one of my favorites in the series, and I might be crazy for saying this, but I kind of wish there was more game. Though truthfully, I did experience some conflicting feelings upon completing the game. On one hand, I'm done. That's another one in the books, and I'm done with the game. On the other hand, this is the last time we ever play as or even see Tanimura. I thought to myself, he's my favorite to play. I think if this is truly the last time I'll ever see him, it's only right that I sing a song to commemorate our friendship. The selfish deed is not freedom. All falls down. Masayoshi Tanimura He's my son If I lay here If I just lay here Would you lie with me and just play Yakuza 4 Let's waste time Chasing both And parrying I might Recomplete this game To see you again If I lay here If I just lay here Would you lie with me And just play Yakuza 4